John Rico, we're already one step ahead. We got a nice compliment on the Curtis Mayfield walkout music, which was, you're already rocking it, but uh, good to see you and welcome to Boston. And I uh, look forward to chatting a little bit. Um, first thing I'd like to talk about, just to kind of set the table, uh, I, I was reading that uh, in the digital health space, uh, the amount of investment <clears throat> through the third quarter of this year has already exceeded the entire 2020 period. And, you know, I hear things about value-based care, consumerism, the public health emergency, all of which seems to have, you know, fueled the digital movement. But it does feel like there's something different in the water that is just creating this massive influx. And we're actually at a very, you know, significant tipping point in the, in the uh, healthcare ecosystem. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts of why the big push into tech and digital and where are we headed? Well, first of all, Chris, thanks for having me here. And it's nice to be back in person. So everybody expects me to start with the pandemic, right? And I will, but perhaps in a slightly different direction. I think what happened is uh, the pandemic caused a massive surge in confidence. And here's what I mean by that, that for many, many years, we've been laying down the infrastructure for digital health. It just didn't happen overnight. But mostly that translated into small pilots then, not surprisingly, the first time a provider, uh, a consumer, a patient tries something new, they hesitate, doesn't go as smoothly, and that results in a pause. The pandemic pushed us beyond that pause. And the result, of course, is that people found out, if you're a consumer, if you're a patient, if you're a healthcare provider, if you're an organization that is providing healthcare at, in, at, at any level, that it works and the outcomes are good. The other thing that happened is that this confidence extended beyond the obvious. So if you take Mayo, our physical medicine and rehab department, I don't think they would have ever come up with a pilot to see if they could do a physical exam online. That was beyond what perhaps most of us would have imagined. We had to do it, they published it works, and that gave this renewed confidence that indeed it is possible that it is scalable, and that financially it works. I'd also say, you mentioned the, the public health emergency, and of course that played a role. I will say, we all know, renewed again on October 15th for another three months. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of angst that uh, uh, it may go away. At Mayo, I am very clear, we owe it to our patients to continue going forward. Nationally, we're about 38x what we were pre-pandemic, about 13 to 17% of uh, of visits are, are, are virtual and I'd say at Mayo we're at 20 and my view is that's just simply our baseline. So it's a little bit of uh, necessity being the mother of invention, I suppose, to some extent, but as you said, seeing the possibility with technology and grasping on it and, and pushing the envelope a little bit further. I, I know Mayo has been extremely active in digital health, a uh, number of transactions and actually has an entire uh, Mayo Clinical Platform that you've, you've been involved with for actually, and it, this pre preceded the pandemic by a number of years, so you really were ahead of the curve. But uh, curious if you could talk a little bit about what that strategy is all about, and we'll, we'll get into a little you know, more of the details about some of the deals you've done, which I think are fascinating. But uh, maybe if you could share with the audience the, the, strat the overall strategy a little bit. Well, thanks for that question. Uh, so this came out of the fact that everybody agrees that we need to transform healthcare. That's pretty much where the agreement stops. When it comes to how, who should lead, how much should it cost, what should the end result be, that's where you do not get a lot of agreement. We, I've been convinced for a while that for transformation to stick in healthcare, healthcare organizations need to take a significant lead. And that comes across as hubris. It actually is the opposite. It's humbling to know that we need to transform ourselves to then be able to transform healthcare. So Mayo Clinic about three years ago uh, announced what we call a bold forward strategy that is really well encapsulated with three words, cure, connect, and transform. Cure states the obvious, there's too much disease left, we need to have more cures. Connect is about connecting people with data to create new knowledge. We set up a center for digital health to do that. And transform is really all about transforming healthcare from a pipeline business, a pipeline sector, to a true platform sector. And when we did that, and we said that's what we need to do, we quickly realized we couldn't import another platform. We had to build the first true healthcare platform because of all the issues around healthcare with data privacy, with um, disparate data sets, structured and unstructured data that we all know about. So we um, struck a partnership with Google, 
then inference came in and we uh, worked with them and, and I will have to keep reminding myself we have equity in inference and I'll keep saying that for the companies I mentioned if it's appropriate. And we built this platform where we put in um, a lot of our data ourselves. It's, it can be best described around four domains, gather, discover, validate, and deliver. And so those are both operational descriptors, but also delivery channels. Gather, you've got the gathered information. We'll put in 10 million, the identified patient records, our omic data, we're putting in 25 million pathology slides. And then you come up with companies like Lucem Health, again, with Comure that we, uh, we have equity in, that is able to take disparate data sets from wearables, from other devices, convert them to international standards, put them in a safe place where others can then um, create new value. And then um, discover is obvious, and we've got to discover with lots of our partners. Validate is a big part of the platform. We have to make sure that we do not fall in the trap of putting out algorithms that aren't properly validated, and that means creating new standards for validation that tell you what the data set was validated on, dealing with the known issues of AI bias that uh, even the previous speakers have spoken about. And, and, and then, uh, very importantly, of course, MailClick delivers. You've got to deliver. And we deliver with partners, but importantly, the platform is there, so it's not only Mayo Clinic. Anybody can deliver, medically home, in the home, uh, in the home um, hospital space, uh, and a variety of other companies that can take the platform and translate the same data into something that can truly impact the lives of people. I think that's really fascinating. So your, your platform is data-based. It's an analytical base as, as your foundation. I'm trying to keep, think this simply. And you're implementing it in the various investments you've made, on, at least on the patient engagement side. Um, I, I, I attended a couple of sessions yesterday. There was a, a very interesting discussion on primary care. You, you mentioned the word humility that came up. And I find that that's an interesting concept, that it's a very complicated business. Uh, yeah, primary care at one end, you know, most developed countries spend a very small fraction of the total healthcare expenditure on primary care, which is probably wrong. And then they spend a disproportionately large percentage at the other end of the spectrum on chronic care. And there's a lot of business models attacking, you know, sort of both of those ends. I'm, I'm curious with, with, and we'll get into the, to the investments in a second, but in terms of your um, strategy, how do you decide where to, take this uh, data platform and implement it in terms of improving outcomes at, at lower cost. Where, where along the lines, there's so many opportunities out there and so many ways to attack this problem. Well, we want the platform to not be about Mayo Clinic. We want the platform to be truly as a, as a delivery vehicle to transform healthcare. For Mayo Clinic, we know what we're good at. We're good at complex and serious disease. That's what we focus on. That's what we're good on. And therefore, when we look at partners, we look at partners who have alignment and that alignment can be around um, the fact that they are aligned around our overall strategy, the patient focus, and that the, er, there at least is the opportunity to deliver transformation. We've started, we've been involved in 262 um, startups, so this is really part of what we do, 188 in the last 10 years. We truly feel the platform will allow us to continue that transformation. Let's, say, let's uh, talk about a couple of, you've, you've done a couple of very significant deals recently. One, the medically home transaction with Kaiser Permanente, a Boston-based company here. Uh, inference, uh, Boston. I'm from Boston, so <laughs> hometown guy. Another Boston-based deal. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those seem to, uh, you, you mentioned you've done over 100 uh, partnerships, but those seem to be a couple of your more recent and significant investments. Um, what set those investments apart from for example, others? They're, they're interesting. That, it's interesting you brought those up because to me, they're very good examples of the power of a platform versus a pipeline. Each of them starts in a different space. At Mayo Clinic, the needs of the patient come first and we realized way before it became hot that we needed to be in patients' homes. In fact, our, our, um, some of our advisors were telling us not to be there, but we knew we had to be there. And so we looked around and when we looked at medically home leadership and we looked at uh, the technology I'd been building, we said we, we, we want to partner. We've built a 24-7 command center in Jacksonville, Florida that does everything for us uh, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Arizona, and in Florida. We found that we can look after patients with cancer, patients with uh, simple pneumonias, but also patients with COVID safely in their home as if they were in the hospital. And we truly feel about 30% of current hospitalizations can be 
taking care at home with the right platform infrastructure that includes food, linen, everything else, not simply just healthcare. The inference um, relationship started from a, a, a visit to Rochester, Minnesota, where Mayo Clinic's headquarters are, and we realized that we had things in common that we wanted to explore. So we said, let's uh, work on uh, cancer drugs together. And we started, and immediately it was obvious that we had come across a glaucoma drug, and that took us into a different startup. But then the COVID pandemic struck. And the power of, of the deep relationship and the trust is that we were able to pivot. I'm very proud of the fact with inference, we've made some very um, basic discoveries, but also been able to come up with um, new ways of approaching treatments, figuring out vaccine efficacy and, F and how its effectiveness changes over time. And if it weren't for the fact that we had all the data going back to the platform, the data never leaving the platform. So we have a federated uh, data model where everything's behind glass. You can use the data, but you cannot take the data out. And that's because at Mayo Clinic, our, the trust patients give us for their data sacrosanct. And because we agreed to these sets of rules and they agreed to these sets of rules, we're really able to make a, um, a, a scalable transformational impact on healthcare. And we'll do more of these. That word you just said, scalable, when I, when I think about what you've been saying, John Rico, is the thing that seems to me to be one of the central tenets of your investments. So going back for a second to med medically home, um, I heard yesterday that somebody quoted some data saying, you know, 70 or 80 percent of the hospital uh, patients that are, are in a hospital would, would prefer to, you know, be at home or be treated at home, which is, makes perfect sense to me. But I, I can see the medically home platform being a wonderful uh, sort of a hub and spokes model to partner with home health companies, uh, DME companies, all, you know, they really the provider side of the business that ultimately delivers the care. We're, we're very focused on digital here, but is, is that the, the overall strategy? I know you've got some partnerships with other health systems, but is that as, as medically home grows and as your sponsorship of that expands, is that the idea? So advanced care at home is a big positive part of our future and that's good. Now, a lot of people want to um, not be in the hospital. I hope everybody doesn't want, wants to not be in the hospital, but of course, some have to be. But for others, there's this uh, pathway. We truly want to make this bigger than, than Mayo, which is why uh, Kaiser Permanente, as you mentioned, are now equal partners. But we also set up a coalition um, of hospitals that want to be involved in it. Our data will remain within Mayo, but all the other data sets are also enriching our data sets so we can continue to make this, as you mentioned, that word scalable, but scalability is only part of it. It also has to constantly improve itself. So we have lots of algorithms running in the background on the platform, creating new knowledge that then allows each experience to be a little more individualized, a little more tailored. And do you ever find, you know, one of the uh, things about, I, I've always, uh, I think we're moving away from this, but when you have large healthcare systems that are primarily based on inpatient revenue and some of that revenue begins to, to go, you know, to the outpatient side, there, there can be friction there and conflicts. Although, you know, with value-based care, I think that's effectively where we're headed. Have, do you ever see any headwinds in, in, in that area coming out of a Mayo or is that just something through leadership and strategy you have to just punch through? Well, no, I think it, for Mayo, it's a little different because we're, we're a complete integrated healthcare system, right? We have, uh, um, all our physicians are salaried um, employees of Mayo Clinic. I'm a fully salaried employee of Mayo Clinic as a physician, as a CEO. So that distinguish, that, that, that gets very blurred for us. Uh, and overall, I think the writing is on the wall and most, uh, most healthcare organizations have already dealt with the nuts and bolts of how to do it. For me, it, however, I'll, I, I will keep coming back. We have to move away from, from the pipeline model to a platform model if we truly want to transform. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're making incremental changes, which are very important, but they won't get at some of the fundamental issues that we have to deal with. I'm sure there's people out there wanting me to ask this question, so who are, you know, have uh, startup companies that would love to partner with the Mayo Clinic. You've got an incredible brand, obviously, both in the United States and internationally. Um, what are some of the things that you might think uh, you'll be looking at, say, over the next 12 to 24 months in connection with your platform, you know, beyond the uh, in investments you've made to date? So it is important for me to just restate the fact that a lot of what will come out of the platform I have no idea about because um, we want others to use the same information and come up with new knowledge. And therefore, the, whole, the, the big part of being a platform is that you can 
meet needs that aren't quite described yet. But having said that, I know where Mayo is going. And what Mayo will be doing is we'll be putting in even more data into the platform. We'll be making sure it's open to those that are willing to play by a, the, a set of rules. We know that digital pathology is going to be a big part of this, so we're going to be putting a lot of effort into that. Uh, we see a big opportunity in health equity to be able to use the platform to point out not only the issues but some of the solutions because it's truly scalable. Uh, data privacy will continue to grow as an issue. Uh, as we all know, it's not simply about the identification or preventing your identification. There are many other levels of layers we have to put in. Today we announced triple blind uh, as we um, tr get ahead of the quantum computing issue uh, in the space. But I'll tell you, I'll be most uh, proud of the fact if at the end of the day, more people adopt the model uh, and the net result is a better um, equitable healthcare system in the United States and globally. Congratulations on your triple blind transaction, by the way. Um, you know, I, when I step back from this thing, if you go back five, six, seven years and you look at health systems, you know, they're predominantly inpatient revenue based. And um, there's just so many interesting things going on in healthcare right now. I, I spoke at a panel of uh, uh, provider based health plans and health plans in some cases are now indicating that more than 50% of their revenue will be attributable to non-insurance issues, to provider side. Um, do you think we'll ever get to the point with health systems where you know, a majority of their revenue are actually attributable to outpatient uh, services as opposed to inpatient or anywhere close to that? I think it's a very hard question to answer. It depends on a lot of factors, but I'd say that I take it in a slightly different direction. I think there has to be more vertical integration. So you mentioned outpatients, but we talked about um, care at home. And so care at home becomes now not only better for patients, but an opportunity. I think we see the blurring of that line, outpatient and patient um, care at home happen. Our orthopedic surgeons can admit somebody at seven in the morning. At 11 o'clock, their hip is in their now getting their care uh, um, digitally. And so that blurring will continue. But I also think what will happen is there'll be a lot of uh, horizontal integration. And that horizontal integration isn't the way we currently think about it in M&A, but horizontal integration around platforms where you don't necessarily need to be tied completely, but you can take advantage of all the digital tools. And that's where I see a lot of the new business models emerging. Gotcha. Um... I guess I'll just ask my final question because I know we have our, our we got our five minute warning a couple of days ago. Uh, hospital system, obviously you are a system it's physician run, obviously. Um, where do you see the hospital system in the next three, five, seven years? Are they gonna look like they are now? Are they gonna be more uh, outpatient focused? Uh, are they gonna be a, a big you know, platform that is, you know, as you said, horizontally and, integrated, integ uh, horizontally and vertically integrated? Uh, any kind of crystal ball if you can share Sure. That. Well, let me, let me just say this because we've talked about digital health as we should have. But I think we're fooling ourselves. We do not understand that we're going to continue to need physical hospitals. Um, unfortunately, everybody's mortal. Most will get sick. We're going to need smart hospitals that are physically located. And we cannot ignore that fact. And we as a country are falling behind on being able to create the right smart hospitals that where the hospital goes to the patient rather than the patient goes to the hospital, friendlier uh, places that are also technology, technologically very advanced. So I'd, I will tell you that Mayo will be making significant investments in that hospital space. At the same time, I mentioned um, vertical and horizontal integration. More, on that, I th more than that, you will continue to see that there will be that blurring that I talked about, but the blurring will now include a lot of atypical partners that will come into the space. And they're really not threats. They're just different ways of accomplishing what truly needs to happen in this country, which is, and then globally, but we have to lead it. We have to transform healthcare. And the only to, to way to transform healthcare is to choose new approaches and to be very careful to make sure that the discovery channels remain open and that everybody who wants to take part in the process is allowed to do so. Terrific. I think we're at the end of our time. So, John Rico, thank you very much for coming to Boston. I really appreciate thank the you, comments. Chris. Great to be here.